Hello and welcome to Lifespan Development Psychology. My name is Matthew Poole. I'm an instructor of psychology at Northeast State Community College and today we're going over chapter 4, Infancy. So firstly we're going to look at the physical growth and development in infants. As far as the physical growth goes, with weight at 4 months old, weight typically doubles. At 1 year, weight is tripled and by age 2, weight has quadrupled. So the average length at 12 months, as far as the height, is about 25 and a half to 30 and a half inches. Now when it comes to brain growth within the first two years, the physical uh, size of brain increases. At birth, the brain is 25% the adult weight, and then as you move to two years of age, it triples and is at 75% of um, adult weight. So when it comes to the neural development, most neurons are present at birth, but not fully development, developed. So you have the most neurons that you will have, but again, they're not uh, exactly developed just yet. And you have billions upon billions of neurons. Uh, whenever it comes to the myelinization, the myelin sheath, uh, these are the fatty cells that protect axons and speeds up neural transmissions. Then you've got pruning, which is unused connections eliminated in favor of much used connections. And then when it comes to the prefrontal cortex within your frontal lobe, this is the least developed portion of brain at birth. Um, and so your frontal lobe in total though, what's fascinating about the brain in that regard is that it's not actually fully developed for adults until about the mid 20s. So they're about 25 years of age your uh, frontal lobe is continuing to develop. Now when it comes to the breakdown of a neuron, now to define it, a neuron is that electrochemical messenger, messenger system of the nervous system. So it's responsible for receiving, interpreting, and sending electrochemical messages across the nervous system. So information is received by these tree branch-like structures, the dendrites, which will move along the uh, cell body, aka the soma, across this axon, which again, this myelin sheath is kind of like that lubricant for um, allowing these messages to uh, you know, speedily move through the axon. And then we'll end up at the synapse, which uh, is right here as illustrated, which will then repeat the cycle of sending those electrochemical messages on to another neuron throughout the nervous system. Now when it comes to motor development, reflexes are inborn. Some are necessary for survival and some signify health and development. So when it comes to survival, all of us at birth have this rooting reflex where whenever you have, like, let's say you touch a baby's cheek, they have the tendency to move toward uh, that general direction. Of course, the breathing reflex and the sucking reflex, of course, for nourishment. Now, some signify health and development, such as Moro reflex, the stepping reflex, and the palmer grasp. So, in the sense of that, you put your finger in a uh, infant's hand, and they will naturally close it up. Now, motor development is orderly. Okay, it follows head down um, and cent centered out principles. Now, with gross motor skills, we've got the large muscle groups and the fine motor skills, such as small coordinated muscles, aka pinching and grasping. And as you can see in the figure to the right, the baby is working on his pincer grasp. Now, with motor and sensory development, with, uh, especially when it comes to sensation and perception, sensation is quite simply whenever the sensory receptors detect sensory stimuli. And perception is in the eye of the beholder. And what I mean by that is perception is how we interpret and organize this sensory information. So it's interpreting information sensed. Okay. When it comes to sensory development, as far as, we, of course, we know about your five, uh, vision, hearing, smell, taste, and touch, as far as with sight goes, it's the least developed at birth. And so newborns can uh, only see about 18 to 16 inches in front of them. Uh, they have a preference for faces, unusual, interesting, and exciting images. Whenever it comes to hearing, this is the most developed at birth. In the womb, babies know the sound of their mother's voice, which I find super fascinating. 
When it comes to touch and pain, physiological reactions indicate sensation of pain when it comes to circumcision. And when it comes to touch, it's necessary and comforting. Okay. When it comes to taste and smell, the ability to distinguish flavors, sweet, salty, sour, and bitter, they prefer the sweet taste, and they identify a mother's smell pretty easily. So when it comes to nutrition, uh, with breastfeeding, of course, breast is best. Uh, that's a funny term I like to <laughs> I like to say. And um, so it's called colostrum, the liquid gold or nutrient dense first days days of life. The breast milk has iron, fats, proteins for proper development, but there are alternatives for breastfeeding, as we all know. Uh, the formula feeding may be necessary in various condition in various conditions, such as the mother not producing enough milk. There's an adoption. Um, and the, or the mother has a communicable disease, etc. All right. So whenever it comes to introducing small foods, start simple. One at a time is best. Space days apart to identify allergies, potential allergies. Malnutrition and clean water access. Um, there's a lot of uh, you know difficulties, of course, that can come from this. So displaced child's disease, the lack of sufficient nutrition, marasmus, the starvation from lack of calories or protein. Uh, milk anemia, the lack of iron from drinking cow's milk in place of more uh, nutritive forms, uh, nutritive foods, excuse me, and clean water, of course, and obviously makes clean formula. So you can see over to the figure to the right, breast milk changes in composition with a newborn's development and needs. So three days to five days, six days, and then 25 days, which I, I found it so fascinating to uh, that how the human body works in that regard to fit the exact needs and changing uh, the exact needs of the newborn. When it comes to sleep and health, Infant sleep requirements include from about 0 to 2 years of age, about uh, close to 13 hours a day. And newborns will sleep from 14 to 17 hours. Okay, With SIDS, of course, many risk factors, many unknowns, sudden infant death syndrome. We've already established that in the last chapter. So if you need a refresher on SIDS, make sure to check out Chapter 3. So whenever it comes to further difficulties with SIDS, sudden infant death syndrome, uh, there are some common causes. So back to sleep. Back sleeping uh, is recommended for every sleep. No soft bedding, blankets, potential hazards such as that that can potentially uh, cause the mouth to be covered up or inhibit the breathing process. Co-sleeping. Now the benefit of that is skin-to-skin -skin contact, but this does have an increased risk of, of child suffocation. Okay. And does increase, obviously, whenever parents use drugs or alcohol because they can be, you know, in a place of, um, oh, what's the word? It's not coming to me momentarily, but a, a place of catatonia, which is an advanced word for saying reduce interest with your environment. Then you've got sleep schedules. Uh, nighttime waking is common, so many infants sleep six hours during night by six months. Not doing so does not only indicate a serious problem, but individual differences. So let's look at cognitive development in infants and toddlers. When it comes to language development, so to give a definition to phonemes, these are just the basic units of speech, which make four memes the smallest meaningful units of speech. So phonemes are just making basic sounds, four means are, are sounds that actually will make some some type of meaningful um, speech. When a child starts vocalizing, they produce all phonemes. With specialization, only native phonemes are easy to reproduce. So here are the stages of language development. We've got reflexive communication uh, for stage one. Stage two, reflexive communication, interest in others. Stage three, intentional communication, Stage four, first words. Stage five, simple sentences, like two word sentences. Stage six, sentences of three or more words. And then stage seven, complex sentences and can have conversations. Let's look at emotional and social development during infancy. When it comes to emotional development, uh, attraction went and withdrawal. Uh, so social smiling appears approximately two months and laughter at three to five months. Displeasure, of course, frustration is normal and sadness can indicate withdrawal. 
Stranger wariness appears around 6 to 15 months of age and is an indicator of memory, familiar versus unfamiliar. We've got separation anxiety. Uh, where is my where is my ca- caregiver gone? And will peak around eight to ten months and declines later with healthy attachment. And we d- discover attachment styles in my uh, introduction to psychology series, which I encourage you to check out if you haven't done so. And then we've got emotional regulation, so co-regulation. The parents help manage uh, the amount of stimuli, soothe and comfort. Self awareness. Hey, I'm aware of myself, right? Uh, the I, me, my, etc., uh, etc. Develops around 15 to 24 months and is, has the understanding of, of the self as an object. So a rogue test includes this mirror test. Does the baby touch their own nose or the mirror? Okay, so Rochat's stages differ, uh, firstly including differentiation, the self versus non-self awareness from birth, situation, next stage, imitation, reaching for objects away from the self by two months, identification, self-referential self-ref- language, uh, pass a rogue test by around two years of age. And in the later stages we have permanence, so we know that uh, permanence is the awareness of something. So one sense of self persists through time and space. And then self-awareness slash meta self-awareness is the third person perspective, able to take into account third person. Now when it comes to attachment, we're going to, I'll briefly go into, I I do it a little bit more in my introduction psychology series, but to briefly introduce attachment styles. This is from the child to the parent. There are four that Mary Ainsworth has identified. Uh, These include secure, insecure, avoidant, insecure, resistant, or ambivalent, and disorganized. So with a secure attachment style, this is predominant. This is most of babies, about 65%. The parent serves as a secure base of exploration. So they utilize the parents as a safe way to navigate their world. They know they can always rely on their parent to be there. Um, Whenever it comes to the uh, insecure avoidant, the toddlers react to the parent like a stranger, unresponsive to parent, and slow to show positive feelings. Now, when it comes to the insecure, resistant, slash ambivalent, this is whenever the, the uh, child will cling to the parent when they leave uh, and reject affection attempts on caregiver return. So whenever the parent in this Mary Ainsworth experiment, whenever a parent would leave, they would want to cling on to the show this clingy behavior. But then whenever the parent returns, it's almost like they are resistant to whenever it returns. So it does not show that clingy behavior. All right. And in this experiment, the child doesn't explore their new environment. So they're not using their parent as a secure base in which to explore from. And then you've got disorganized. This is whenever it's very concerning in the sense that there's potential abuse within the home. So this is obviously the least secure attachment. Uh, It's often unpredictable parent behavior, again, maybe from abuse. And the child has not learned emotional regulation from this model. So in this experiment, whenever the parent leaves, they'll kind of freeze or run around erratically, and then when the parent returns, it's almost like they try to avoid the parent, which again, signal for potential abuse within the house. Okay. Now revisiting Eric Erickson's stages of psychosocial development, we've got uh, in infancy, the trust versus mistrust phase. Then we've got autonomy versus shame and doubt that's experienced in infants and toddlers. So Uh, Just to quickly revisit the trust versus mistrust phase. Apparently, to Erickson, trust is established between year between the or should I say within the first year of life, and so they learn. You know, if they cry out to their caregiver, does their caregiver come and console them? They will apparently establish if the world is a trusting place based on uh, those experiences in the first year of life. And if this is uh, an unresolved issue, they may develop a sense of mistrust with the world, like the the world is an untrustworthy or dangerous place. Also experienced during this phase of life is autonomy versus shame and doubt. If we're successful with this stage, do, are we comfortable with taking initiative and trying to do things ourselves, uh, or that we uh, deem as desirable? Are we to, to, able to develop independence in our tasks? 
Now, if it's unresolved, we may develop a sense of shame or doubt in our capabilities. We may be discouraged in our own autonomy and our own independence. So the child learns to doubt their instincts and maybe feel shame at the thought or when they do take initiative. So that is going to complete this chapter of Lifespan Development Psychology. I will see you in the next one. Have a great day. Bye-bye.